eat bold with Subway Fiery Footlong Subs. So hot they'll burn the wimp right out of you. Try the new Turkey Jalapeno Melt, a fiery twist on a legendary flavor, and the bold, delicious buffalo chicken, backed by popular demand. Subway, eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report. Taping this on a Tuesday running Wednesday. I called Chuck Klosterman because he said he had a Super Bowl pick and it was going to be 10 minutes and we're going to throw it at the end of the Cousin Sal Chad Millman podcast. And uh, as always with me and Chuck, we ended up going for 45 minutes. So here it is Chuck Klosterman on the Subway Fresh Tech Hotline. What's happening? Not too much. You know, I'm not really in the predicting game like you are, so this is kind of outside my wheelhouse. I know. That's why I was excited. I was like, we got to do this on a podcast. You never pick stuff. You're yeah, anti-pick. I'm not, I just, I'm not much of a, I'm just not much in the predicting game. But maybe I'm getting, maybe I should get into the predicting game. It seems like a good game to be into now. It's good because nobody remembers the ones you miss, but they remember the ones you make. That came true. Well, so. who knows? I guess who can judge people's memory? But I do. I have a feeling who's going to win the Super Bowl this year, and, I'm, and I have a stronger than usual feeling. And I think it's probably a little bit outside what other people are thinking. And I'm, I'm not even sure why I feel so strongly about it, but I think Tennessee is going to win the Super Bowl. Oh. And I tell think us Tennessee why. Is going to beat, I think Tennessee is going to beat Green Bay in the Super Bowl. And here's sort of my logic on this. Um, okay, the easy answer, of course, is that they underperformed at the early part of last year and then finished strong, right? Um, so I kind of thought this might be a hot pick, but no one seems to be saying this. But my reasoning is more so based on these two factors. One, I don't think Vince Young is going to have a great career as an NFL quarterback, he's not going to become a Hall of Fame quarterback, certainly. But doesn't he seem like the kind of person who has the potential to have two or three very good years, the way so many quarterbacks seem to? Like a Steve And if that was to be the case, wouldn't that happen now, sort of at the nexus point of where he still has the physical skills he had in college and might be able to sort of make the transfer into being a good passer as well? So shouldn't it really be this year or next year? Yes, it would be, I, I would say Steve, Steve McNair is a good uh, comparison. That somebody that maybe didn't have a Hall of Fame career, but had two or three apex years. Yeah, well, you see a lot of guys like that. That seems really common. I mean, McNair had a pretty good career overall, but people like you know Boomer Esiason and you know uh, Joe Theismann and Ron Jaworski and all these. You know, when you look back at the history of who was named NFL Offensive MVP, it's often mm-hmm. how you often see these quarterbacks come up who, for the most part of their career, were uh, either seemed to be young and struggling or too old. But there's that little window in the middle. And I think this is going to be probably his year where he's really successful. And I also think the fact that they play a very difficult schedule is going to play to their advantage. Because I, the I think all the teams in the AFC are going to be bunched up. Okay? I think that, there's no, that a lot of the records are going to all be sort of in the 10-6, 11-5, 9-7 range. So if you're one of the teams who able, who's able to get into the playoffs with sort of that bunch in the middle, it's going to be the team who played the best competition over the year who will be the most ready for the playoffs. And I think that their good schedule will paradoxically be to their advantage, even though usually people use that as an indicator of who's going to underachieve. So you're saying it almost would toughen them up. It will. Well, I, just, I think that because... You know, there's almost a bigger question of whether or not they will make the playoffs and if they'll succeed in the playoffs. But once you make the playoffs, if you've played a difficult schedule, it is to your advantage. So you're saying 10-6, and six, they sneak in as a 5 or a 6 seed, and then they just go on a little run. I think that's very likely. Or even maybe, you know, uh, winning the South at 11-5 and five if the Colts were to somehow struggle. 
And they okay, also but... they play the Colts late in the year, right? So if the yeah. Colts don't struggle, I think they play them in like week 17, they'll probably be playing Indianapolis with nobody playing. So if they need to get into the playoffs, if it really comes down to them needing wins at the end to kind of slide in, they probably will have that advantage. I think – I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I'm pretty sure they play the Colts in week 14 and week 17. It was weird how 17. they I, – I know they play them in 17. In 14, it, the Colts will certainly still be at full strength. But. but it's just weird that they don't see the Colts for the first three months of the season. It is. And then they see them twice. Yeah. But I would almost feel like that's an advantage because there's no team you want to see in Week 17 more than the Colts because it hasn't meant anything to them in five years. Precisely. I mean, this is if we're assuming that the Colts are still great, well, then, you know, they'll be playing like the JV team. But if that game is meaningful, if they, I'll tell you what, if they're playing the Colts in Week 17 and the Colts are playing everyone, I think that would strengthen my prediction. How much of this is affected by the fact that you're a gigantic college football fan? And you love what Vince Young did that year in 2006, and you just are you, you're projecting basically your hope that that continues in the NFL. I don't. I mean, that's that's kind of interesting psychology, I guess. I mean, I, I, I it is odd because now that you mention it, I never thought of that. But I I, I, I am feeling a weird amount of sympathy sympathy for Matt Weiner now. Maybe there is some connection. I don't know. <laughs> um, I also I think the Titans have a good coach, and I think that that Fisher would be willing to be one of the rare NFL coaches who might gamble and sort of let Vince Young um, sort of play almost a collegiate style, which would shorten the length of his career overall but could have a huge benefit for two years. Well, they will have an identity, which I, which I like, in that they're going to control the clock, they're going to pound the ball, um, and as you said, Fisher, every couple of years he – they're good again, and it's you know at some point it stops being an accident. I think he's one of the top five or six coaches, and they do have talent. Um, the Colts part worries me. You know, it's just so tough to 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 jump them in that division. Although I think they oh, did it. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Did they do it two years ago or three? One of these times they they leaped. I think it was just two years, years ago, ago, right? Yeah, two years. Two ago. years ago they were like fourteen and two or something. You know? So it can be done. Yeah. But I like it. So also, they want. Okay. Oh, go ahead. What were you going to ask? Well, the Green Bay part, that's unlike you because that's uh, the bandwagon pick for the NFC this year. Well, I know. But then my, my thinking on that is kind of like this. It seems inevitably the two teams that meet in the Super Bowl tend to be one team many people expected and one team people did not. And True. I, they just seem to be the best team over there. Uh, I was uh, – I mean, it, it's uh, – they probably have – I don't know, probably the best quarterback in the NFC now, don't they? Wouldn't that be the consensus? Well, Breeze or him, I suppose. But it, it, yeah, it, 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 Breeze has the belt still. He has the championship yeah. belt. Rodgers, I think, is the he's the chic MVP pick, and I know I've made that pick. I've jumped on that bandwagon because he did have a monster year last year. So well, but and also, doesn't it seem like that's a bandwagon pick that still? Uh, <laughs> There's not a lot of attention on any of the individual parts of the Packers outside of Rodgers, but they don't well, seem to be a team that's really in your face. It's uh, people's. It, it's basically they fit that 2009 Saints slot where every year you have this team that is the explosive offense team, and nobody can handle them. And that's you know, and forget about the other side of the ball. That's just they're dominating on that one end, and it seems like they're the most logical pick for that. Although. You can make a case that the 2010 Patriots would be the other pick because they have so many weapons uh, and Brady and they revamped the tight ends and all that, but I, I just think their defense just isn't isn't good enough to vault them that, that level. That seems to be the, I don't know, it's the conventional wisdom on there that even if their offense puts, puts up points that they're just not going to be as, uh, that, that, they, that, that you can always score against them, so therefore a lot of bad teams are going to be in games against the Patriots. Yeah, which is weird because did you ever think Bill Belichick, like you would ever say that about one of his teams? Like, oh, man, if their defense can hold up. It's like, well, this is Bill Belichick. But, you know, at some point, I think he's like 59 now. He's 58 years old, 59 at some point. Um, I just don't think that those rules apply anymore. I well, he's you... just, so it seems so random. He was in Cleveland, he's an idiot. Then he's in New England, he's a genius. So now he could, who knows? I mean, he could swing back the other way. I, it, 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 I, I do think coaching... Uh, you know, in the NFL, in the NBA, all this, you know, it, 
it becomes very easy to start sort of looking at what guys are good and what guys are bad because we give the players the credit when they're success and we blame the coaches when they're failure. True. But they, I think the NFL, out of all the sports, is the one where the coach can do the most most damage. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like the Cavs can win 62 games with Mike Brown, and I'm not even sure if, if he's a, even a mediocre coach, but it doesn't because ultimately you have LeBron and whatever. And I don't think it's going to matter who coaches Miami this year. They're, they're going to win 65 games with the janitor. But in football, if you have a bad coach, it's just, just no – it affects every – it affects preparation, whether the guys are in shape, whether they give a crap, the game plans. Um, and it's just over if your coach sucks. So. One, uh, one quick thing. before uh, yeah. I did see on Twitter, you did watch the Boise State-Virginia Tech game last night. And you I did. You know, it. it was a smart scheduling job by ESPN because there was nothing on last night. And, you know, it, it, the game looked good. Like, the uniform clash looked good. It was exciting. You had a number three against a number ten. I got sucked they used in. To, they used to have Florida State play Miami that night. That used to always be the Monday night opening game like that. But uh, this was even better. Um, I, uh, I I think now Boise probably is going to go 12-0 and lose in the BCS championship game. I know that's probably the obvious choice. But then again, the most important position in football is quarterback. And I think they have the best quarterback. He's just right. completely immune to throwing interceptions. And, he, and he, it's not like he... Doesn't take risks. He throws up, you know, throws down field, but he's just really poised. I thought one of the things I liked about the game last night, other than hearing Musburger, which just brings you back to the seventies, you know, it's like having yeah. a flashback. But the two announcers, they, I, I think Herb Street's really good, and yeah. they just, they just kind of, they tell you what's going on. They're not trying to do shticks. They're just banging it out. Here's what's happening. Here's a, here's what needs to happen on this. Here's why this play is important. And the crowd was great. You know, and that's one thing that we don't have a lot in the NFL anymore is you don't have crowds like that crowd last night where you have 90,000 people, 80,000 are these crazy Virginia Tech fans, and then crammed into this one section where all the crazy Boise State fans. It was just really cool. I thought I enjoyed it. Well, it was, I might, I, my favorite part of the announcing was at one point when Virginia Tech, I think, had like had cut the lead to 17-14 and they were cutting to commercial, and Brent was like, the establishment is coming back. Like he was right. definitely trying, and because Brent hates hippies, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's true. He, so sometimes he'll do a game where, like, he's out of Berkeley doing a Cal game, and in yeah. those games they always have some goofballs sitting in trees outside the stadium, like environmentalists, and Brent just absolutely eviscerates them every time. So I almost right. sort of felt like, in Brent's mind, just because he's an establishment guy, is he, you know, is he thinking that Virginia Tech success is meaningful for culture? Because the rest of the game, of course, they, the announcers, like everybody else in the world, was rooting for Boise. You know? That's good. I I decided that I'm going to have my, my Twitter followers recommend one college football game a week for me to watch. Because every week there has to be one game as good as that game last night, right? Well, I mean, last weekend there was a bunch of them. I mean, the old, the end of the old Miss game was great. I mean, that one, this next Saturday, I, I have to go to a wedding in Portland. I'm going to miss every game on Saturday. And I'm very disappointed. But, uh... You know, there, there's, there's the thing about having your Twitter followers predict what game, it's just going to be a bunch of bozos telling you to watch the team they like. Because you never really know. You know, like, like Ohio State Miami this weekend could be a dull game. And there could be some strange game that goes into four overtimes. You just kind of got to watch them all and flip around. It's the only way to do it. So you don't think every week there's not a game where it's at least two top 20 teams and there's something at stake? That doesn't happen. Oh, there's always something at stake. The outcome matters. But for in terms of watching the game itself, it's hard to predict that. You know, I mean, uh, it, it's just impl- – because you know, a lot of times, I mean, especially in the, with the powerhouse conferences, um, like there's a lot of SEC games that I'll, be, I'll wait a month to see. You know, like say it'll be like, you know, you know Auburn, Alabama or something. Um, and it'll be a 13-6 game. Because they're just yeah. these two kind of big, powerful, muscular teams trying to pound each other. So you just sort of have to be really flexible and just always kind of flip around, you know, like a like the uh, in the afternoon yesterday, the Navy Maryland game was extremely entertaining. Did you watch any of that? Did not see any of that. No. Uh, there was uh, like a Navy was inside the ten, I think, four times and scored once, and not during. It was just really it was very dramatic because they, I think that they had drives end at the one-yard line at least twice, maybe three times. It's a very interesting yeah. game. Yeah. 
Well, I'm going to start paying more attention to it because it's the same reason that I kind of like watching the soccer on Saturday mornings. It's the crowds that I grew up with. It's crowds that actually give a crap. And I think we see so often with what's happened with the four major sports, it's just sometimes the crowd just seems like they don't want to be there. You know, it does feel like we talked about the life or death thing last time. I mean, it's a metaphor, but um, it just feels more important. Like that game last night, I really felt like the Virginia Tech fans were going to go home and not be able to sleep for like four days. You know, in professional well, sports, I don't get that feeling a lot anymore. No, I mean, it, it, it was, it must have been pretty palpable. I watched the first 20 minutes of that game with the sound off because I was listening to a record. But even just watching the game, I, you could almost see that people were just losing their minds. You could see how jacked up Boise State was, right. especially on defense for those first three or four possessions. It really does come through the screen the way it just never happens in pro sports. There's just no comparison. Well, and especially for Boise State, like, they lose that game. There's just the BCS thing is gone. So, in, in, in weirdly, it was a playoff game for them. Week one, you can lose a week one game normally in college football and still rally back and have a chance. But for them, it was like if they lost that game, there's everybody would have just pointed to it and said, nope, that was the one good team you played and you lost. Well, so. I mean, it is, it's, it's strange because I hate to be somebody who's like on the BCS side, but last night's game is a great example of the upside to having a playoff. There's yeah. absolutely no way that game is interesting the way it was if there's a playoff, because if there was, if there was a 16-team playoff, there would still be a chance that Boise State could lose to Virginia Tech, run their schedule, and be the 16th or 15th seed or whatever. You know, yeah. I, and that, but, you know, watching it, that last possession they had last night, that was the whole season. And that just for that to happen in September is crazy, you know? I will say the one thing, just as a football fan, used to a high standard, like just watching how Virginia Tech handled that last three minutes. It was so embarrassing. Like, I, if I'm playing a video game, I could have done a better job play calling. Not just well, when they had the on, lead. Yeah, the throw on third down you're talking about. Well, the throw on third down is just terrible. It's football 101. You know, it kills the clock, and it's just stupid. And then, you know, they still they only needed 40 yards to get in the field goal range. They, go, they throw a 55-yard bomb on first down. And then in fourth down, they throw another 55-yard bomb. It's like, who does that? You're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to march down the field. They had timeouts. I don't know. It was just, they it did. Was I mean, I, really I bad. That, that, yeah. I mean, to me though, the, the the position before that was the bigger mistake. Because right. if they run, if they run a sweep on third down, that takes seven seconds. They run the clock down and punt. It's basically the same scenario for Boise State, except they have like a minute and ten seconds or a minute and nine seconds. Right. Because once they got across big feet, midfield, I basically concluded that Boise State was going to win. I was surprised they scored so quickly, but you know. Uh, but they, I mean, Virginia Tech has a limited number, it seems, of passing plays in their playbook. Right. Only, they seem to only run a handful of them, and they are most of the ones that are on the EA College Football video game. I know. That, it that, that me. seems to that, you know they, they run four verticals sometimes. They run the play. They run those kind of wheelie plays. <laughs> they have the angle play with the tailback. That's about it. That seems to be all of them. You know. Yeah, it's like when you play the guy. Like I used to play my old roommate in the '90s. We used to play Tecmo and. And he would always just run the deep pass play. And I always knew it was coming, but he would just keep doing it and keep doing it. And that was kind of how I felt Virginia Tech. It was like they only had eight plays. Uh, all right, guys, go down. Just get, I'll, He'll chuck it down there. Good luck. Anyway, um, well, let's keep talking about this because I might I, you might be sucking me into college football a tiny bit here. I still don't have well, a team, I, but you don't have a team either. No, I have, I have many teams. There are many teams I have rooting interest for. I'm so you're like the guy from Navy. Big Love. I'm interested in Georgia Tech. I'm interested in Nebraska. I'm interested in Notre Dame. I'm interested in Stanford. Actually, I'm interested in a whole bunch of Pac-10 teams. There's a lot of Big 12 teams I like. Um, you know, I like Boise State. I like Nevada. Uh, I, I, I feel like there are probably 10 to 15 teams every Saturday that I have an, uh, like an emotional investment with, just not to the degree to you that you have with your teams. So... For the most part, you're a sports atheist, but with college, you're a sports polygamist. Yes, I suppose if we're going to use your analogy. I still never bought this sports atheist thing because that would imply that I don't believe sports exist. Uh, well, you have to figure speech. I'm not, I'm not, I, you know, I'm, just not, I'm not like a loyalist like that. But it's, to me, it's, you know, when you're loyal to a college program, it's very different than being loyal to a pro team. I mean, you're loyal to, you know, the Patriots. And throughout your life, you know, they have changed 
stadiums, they've changed uniforms, they've obviously changed all their players, all their coaches, all their management, all their ownership. If you kind of root for a college, you really are rooting for the institution. Like, yeah. rooting for Stanford now is not that different than rooting for Stanford in 1955. No, and, and also... And this is probably one of the reasons why I regret going to college where I did. Not that I didn't like Holy Cross, but, man, you go to one of those schools that has a real football program, and all your friends from college, like, it's this bond that you have for the next 60 years, basically. Oh, are we going back? Like, think if you went to Michigan, for example, like the guys in the Big Chill. You know, every year, yeah, oh, we're we're playing Ohio State this weekend. Where are we watching it? You know, that's a whole element that I don't have because of the college that I picked, so. I don't know. Well, I have a kind of strange bugs, yeah. personal aspect with that because I went to the University of North Dakota, and they're yes. still um, like they don't really have a Division One football program. But their biggest it was Division Two when I was there, and the biggest rival was North Dakota State. Yeah. And now North Dakota State is one, is in a, you know a subdivision team, and they beat Kansas this weekend, six to three. Um, and which is a little disappointment because I like Kansas, I like Turner Gill, but at the same time, it's. I like the idea of North Dakota State being on the crawl. So now I'm sort of rooting for a college, which while I was there, I constantly root against. But there's just not enough things for North Dakota, so you've got to root for those things. You know? But you have hockey. Yeah, yeah. There's ho- hockey's great. Yeah, you know, whatever. Division. <laughs> I thought they have a great hockey program, that's sure. Yeah, you know, but I... Uh, if they if UND goes to the final four, the Frozen Four, whatever, I'll yeah. I'll watch for the title game. But that's about as far as it goes. I follow the WCHA standings online, but I mean I could be following anything. I could be following flag football for all I know. I'm not watching any of the games. The Frozen Four seems like it's either underrated or properly rated, but it's definitely not overrated because if you watch like the Final Four game or the actual finals, it's really exciting. Like the crowd's going crazy, and the guys are flying around. It's about as passionate as you'll see hockey other than in the cup playoffs. But yet, it's one of those things that nobody even knows who's in it until the Final Four, like the casual sports fan. It's on that one weekend. You're like, oh, Frozen Four. But you, well, there's no build-up for it. It's always, it can, a lot of times to the, to the casual sports fan, it seems less meaningful because it's like Michigan playing Maine or something. You know? and they just, yeah. they're, they're like playing some school you just never associate with having any kind of sports. So it seemed, you know, it would be it would be very different if the big schools in hockey were the same as the big schools for basketball and football. Because I even feel this to a degree sometimes happens with the with the college world series. Yeah. But though a lot of times there's you know, there are all big schools in there, but sometimes it'll be a college that I was like, Well, I guess they have a good baseball program because everything else is bad. Yeah, the College World Series is tough as a casual fan because there's all these games and you never know, like, what's a you, – you turn on the TV, it's like, oh, this is game 12. It's like, what does that mean? Cause, cause it is. Explain it's this confusing. I'm not even I, – I mean, you'll probably know this. I don't. So in the championship of the College World Series, is it a three-game series? Do you play three games? or is it? One? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> it seems that's like such something a ba- we should know. I mean, even if we don't watch it, it seems like something that we should know, right? I agree. I don't know how many teams yeah. are in the NCAA hockey championships. Is it 32? Is it 64? I don't know. I'm assuming 32. Well, it's no, no way. No, it's you like think it's less. less? Like, oh, totally. Because I, I mean, there's not, there's not that many teams who have Division One hockey programs. It's like okay, like if you win the WCHA, you go. I think an at-large team goes. I feel like that their tournament is 16 teams. It's weird that we don't know this, and yet I totally yeah. know the women's softball World Series rules. Oh, how does that work? <laughs> I don't know. It's probably, oh. I think it's thirty-two teams. <laughs> they don't. I don't think they do the. Actually, I don't know, but it's on all the time. I feel like I should know. It's weird yeah, that it's I, on more than I. Uh, they had when I lived in Ohio, like like Kent or Akron U or somebody had a really good women's fast pitch softball team. It's kind of an exciting game, I have to say. The pitching style really is bizarre and uh, seemingly highly dangerous. But I agree, and, it, and it's the thing that works about it is that it feels different than baseball. You know what I'm saying? Like, Well, it, it kind of seems like a baseball game, um, like when Gibson was pitching and McClain, like the pitchers are so overpowering. Yeah. That, you know, that you, you, your hope basically is to draw a walk, butt twice, and, you know, scoring a sacrifice fly or something. Because you just, nobody, there's just never a, like, there's, 
it's never a slugfest, you know. It's like watching arena football or something where it's they've they've taken a sport that I'm familiar with and put enough twists on it that I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, nobody can hit that pitcher. Wow, if you, you can hit a single and it goes flying through the infield. Like, there's things about it visually that I, I kind of enjoy. Um, well, those little tweaks are, you know, like you say about arena football, that is an interesting subject. Like, I do feel, maybe we've even talked about this before, that whoever sort of uh, was the pioneer for the CFL, they must really regret the three-down idea. Because that changed, I, I, I know what their thinking was at the time. If we use three downs, there'll be more passing, and passing's the most interesting part, the most entertaining part. But it really yeah. does make the game less watchable. It's pretty dumb. At the very least, they, it, there should only be one quarter where it's three downs, and then the other ones are four downs. You know what's interesting, though, is that nobody has figured out a way to successfully tweak basketball so that it's a sport that doesn't really look like basketball, but it still has most of the elements. Like, we've had slam ball. We've had um, – that's really it. I guess slam ball is the only attempt. Do you think there'd be some sort of, like, shorter court, four on four, or, or some idea along those lines that would they people would try to catch on with? Well, like, you'd maybe it? play in a court where you could, like, play the ball off the wall and stuff like that. Like, it would be a 60-foot court, uh, and the wall would be maybe uh, – you know, sheer with the basket, and if the ball came off the wall, it was still in play or something like that. Like some sort yeah. of what would be what would be the purpose of this? I don't know. I'm just saying. Like it seems <laughs> like with other sports, like people are always trying to come up with wrinkles for football and soccer. You had indoor soccer, you know, and and then uh, softball is different than baseball. But with basketball, it's like that's basketball is the only way we do it. The, the way that. Women's basketball looks the same as men's basketball. The court's always the same. The ball changes a little bit. But um, the only people that have really attempted to mess with it, who, what is it, Iowa, where they have the one woman's player can't go over half court or whatever that rule is? Well, I know Iowa was the last state to change. Initially, women's basketball was always this is an incredibly archaic idea, but that basketball would be too tiring for women. So there was three girls on one side of the court, Three on the other side, they couldn't cross half court, and then one player could, like the one, like the rover essentially could go back and forth. And it got outlawed because it seemed really demeaning, and when you describe it like that, it does seem demeaning. But yet yeah. at the same time, if they would have instead looked at that as like a degree of uniqueness, it could make the game more interesting because then it wouldn't make the women's game so often compared to the men's game, and that's what kills it. Like, the, you know, the reason the WNBA struggles is because people cannot help but compare it to the NBA. The name is similar, the game is similar, everything is similar except the way they're playing. But if their game was a little different like that, if there was different sort of like a if, – if you could only have one player, you know, only like the Cheryl Miller type could go both ways, and everybody else had to I, – I just think that would be bringing new elements of strategy, and you could make the argument that in some ways it's a more refined game because it's specialists, you know. Listen, the WNBA needs to do something. I I was also for the lowering the rims idea, which is a Kevin Wilds thing about lowering it to, I don't know, nine feet, and then maybe people could actually done it. Like they have to do something. Whatever it's been fourteen years now, and whatever everything they've haven't tried, obviously they need to make an effort and make it a little different. Now the Iowa thing, though. Now what if there was a men's league? Where it was five on five and you had only one rover and the other four players stayed on their side of the court. That would be pretty interesting. Uh, like, okay, would it still be five on five? So essentially you'd have Maybe nine make it four on four. No, maybe yeah. make it four on four. Yeah. And only one guy can go on each side? The, uh, the problem with, uh, with that style, I suppose, is A, it creates the uncomfortable situation for the audience to watch people with their hands on their hips waiting for the ball to come over. <laughs> yeah, um, true. And it essentially does end the running game. Like you yeah. can't really you can't really run a break and, and, if, and you know and it's just you know the thing about the WNBA like lowering the basket to nine feet though uh, Yeah, you know, it seems odd to watch those games because no one's dunking and we just associate the pro game with dunking, but how often do you come away from a, a game saying, That was a great game, there were so many dunks? Besides, like, uh, like the Louisville-Houston Final Four game or whatever from the 80s. For the most right. part, it's not that – I mean, it can't just be the dunking, you know. I, I mean, when, when I, if, I, if I enjoy watching a game, 
I very rarely from the amount of junk. So it's something else. There's just something else about it. I'm not sure what that is. Well, I think it's because it seems so grounded that maybe if the rims were lower, it wouldn't seem quite as grounded. But you're probably right. I mean, how many dunks? I'd have to think about this. Maybe it's more like the guys are in the air doing stuff, and because the basket is higher, you know, when they're in the air, more things can happen. Whereas in the WNBA, everybody's so grounded and the rim's so high, like there's really no mystery about anything. Does that make sense? Well, it is, and it just, I, I think it, it's, a, you know, the, when you, like, you, we've often just talked about this between, say, college basketball and pro basketball. You just want to watch the game at the highest possible level. You don't want to see, you never want to see a game where someone on the floor reminds you of yourself. Yep. And I think for a lot of, 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 so like, you know, relatively serious sports fans, if they watch a WNBA game, all the girls in the court could kill them. You know, all those women would eat them alive, but the way it looks doesn't look different. It doesn't look different enough to when they remember being 20 years old or 19. Yeah. And like with women's tennis, you know, there's two reasons I think it, it works, and it's clearly the most successful professional sport, but... The first one is the looks factor, and everybody's in shape. And, you know, you look at the Wozniak-Sharapova match on Monday, and you're just not getting in that in any of the sports if you're a horny guy. But then the second part is tennis got so fast, and it, it's almost like the woman, the speed that they play is, is, a, is a more fun speed to watch tennis. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely, because it's not just all aces in one volley. I mean, they, 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 it, make, it makes for a better game. But also tennis just has the advantage of, I mean, I'm kind of a tennis fan, but it's a lower stakes game. Like if you have a sport where people don't really need to follow it until the very end of the tournament, and only, only four times a year, only three times a year, or, or, or they don't have to really start paying attention until people get to the semifinals, it sort of lifts a lot of pressure off the sport. Because for a sport to succeed, you've got to be able to watch it when there's not that much going on. And it does, you know, when, when, when just the sport itself is enough to sort of constitute your interest. Yeah, golf is like that. Because golf has that steady audience of people that every weekend they're going to watch a tournament. And they don't care where the guys are playing. As long as they're outdoors and the sun's shining, they're going to watch it. I don't think tennis yeah. is at that point. So you, you'll, will you watch golf at home? Just no, like, I like won't. A, I, I, I don't know. I was just wondering if you did. Some people do. Some people really like it. Some people like it for, it's strange. They really connect it to napping. <laughs> that they'll watch, they'll watch golf. And they also sort of fall asleep and stuff. And it, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, like the ultimate form of, of escapist, sort of. Like they're escaping from their own life in their living room. Well, for that's why I think it skews toward people 50 and over. And you see, like, the erectile dysfunction ads and the BMW ads and the heart pill ads and stuff like that because 25-year-old people aren't home watching the Barclays tournament. You know, they're watching uh, other stuff. That's where it skews. Um, so do you, you, think you, do you think there's a higher likelihood that you will watch golf in 15 years on television? Yes. And same for you, yeah, by I, the way. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, if it's – because for also, you know, golf's a big-time investment. And I guess in the summer there's not much going on, but if there's sort of other sports, you have the advantage that seeming you can watch sports whenever you want. That, 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 that's just part of your job, it's part of your life. You can watch it if it, was, if it was seven days a week and it was five hours of sports a day, you would have no problem saying, I'm just going to watch these events. But for me, to blow two or three of the hours I get for sports watching on golf, that just seems like, I don't know, it would be, like, be like drinking Zima on the one that it could go out or something. It's just a crazy move, you know? But we're, but we're talking 15 years from now. Who the hell knows what we'll like 15 years from now? I think there's something about golf that sucks people in when they turn 50. All of a sudden, it seems totally logical to just sit in front of the TV and watch some random tournament. And plus, I well, think you play more golf when you're older. Well, that's, that's the other thing. What percentage of the golf audience is are also golfers? I think it's pretty high, especially when you get when people get older and retired people, they tend to watch more of it. Um, I, I always, I just think it's boring unless it's one of the majors, because all the tournaments seem like it's the same tournament basically. Well, you know? I, I, I just, I can't imagine starting playing golf in ten years, so I don't. That would be the only way I think that way I'd want to watch it. You know. I beg to differ that I have more time to watch sports than you. I have two kids. You have no kids. 
I you know, have more but time to watch sports than I do. You watched some Navy Maryland game yesterday. I didn't have to. I, I couldn't have pulled off a Navy Maryland Labor Day game. Well, okay, but here's the tricky. Thing. Yeah, that, in that way, it's true. I mean, in theory, you're right. But you know, the Navy Maryland game was sort of on in uh, like kind of the late afternoon. Uh, my wife was working. You know, she mm. was. Yeah, I, I was able to just sort of kind of watch it. But what the thing that I can't control are like. Um, the things I want to see most, say the late Saturday game for college football, the Sunday night NFL game, often the Monday night or the Thursday night game, those are the nights when it's hard for me sometimes to justify, I'm going to watch this game for four hours, and when my wife asks me, well, uh, who's playing, who do you want to win, and my answer is, well, I don't care, I just want to see it. You know, yeah. that's, that, it's a hard argument, you know. But you well, are, you're, you... also, you're on, the, you're on the West Coast, so a lot of the things that you, you can watch the events and you still have the night, that's what makes it tough. The West Coast is, that's one of the reasons I love it here. But don't you think once people get married and or have kids, they kind of have to choose to some degree between college football and pro football because you can't bang out two straight 12-hour days of football on the weekend and stay married. It's impossible. Yeah. That's probably true. Like what? There, there's no wife who's understanding enough to say, all right, so Saturday and Sunday you're out. I'll just do my own thing. And But we'll always have Friday that's nights. True. You're right. You're right. I know. I know that's the case, but it's just it's tough. It's, it, well, it I, have, is, I have uh, a solution for you, but it's too late for both of us because we both got married. But for the people out there wondering how to avoid that, you marry a doctor. That's what my dad did. My dad for wife number two he went for a doctor. Doctors are on call, especially if you get an OBGYN like my stepmother. Every three weekends, mm-hmm. they're gone. So you still, have your, you still have 17, 18 weekends a year where they're on call, and, and you've got to put in like the, a couple phone calls, the how's it going, anybody in labor, all that stuff. But for the most part, you're free. You're out. But oh, see, the thing about having kids, though, I mean, you're not really going you're not, you, you, In fact, you had recently told me how you can't even get to movies, so you're in the house at least. That's a big part of it. Being in the house, you know. No, no, no. I didn't say I can't get to movies. I said that with dates, when you have date night, which we, we try to have at least twice a week, you, you, you don't want to waste date night on a movie, especially when we can watch a movie here. Rather go to like a dinner. So what do you do on date nights? You go to dinners. You go over to friend's well, house. You get together. You go to, go to a sporting event. Go to a concert. All kinds of stuff. So you go to a, but you go to a sporting event on go date to, night? Go to Eyes Wide Shut key parties. <laughs> well, I actually, I lucked out because my wife does like basketball. She likes going to basketball games if the seats are good. Well, and I have has, to say, I mean, my wife is really, I don't want to make it sound like my wife stopped. She's, she's incre- incredibly open-minded about this, but I'm just saying I feel guilty about it. Like, I even last night watching Boise and Virginia Tech, I know she didn't feel like sitting through that. You know, right. and, and it sort of it takes away some of the watcher's enjoyment. If the person you're with, you know, you're kind of almost penalizing them because while she thinks basketball is okay, she hates football. She doesn't understand it. She finds none of it interesting. She hates the culture behind it. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't like anything. Any, there's nothing about it that she finds. That she, the only game that she's ever liked, in fact, in my memory, was the last two minutes of that Boise State Oklahoma game. Where they ran like the hook and ladder and the oh, yeah, yeah. so so every game would have to be like that, or you know, or, or the entire game would have to be like the last play of Cal Stanford or something like that would be the only way she would find it intriguing. So I guess it would be watching rugby, but, you know. But um, uh, so I, I feel I feel really bad about it because she's an awesome person. I love my wife's great. I want her to be happy too, you know. But I just I also want to watch these games, and I'm just always in my mind trying to figure out what, how much. Um, uh, how much of her enjoyment am I taking away from this thing that I love but I really can't explain why I love it? All right, I have two tips for you. One, get more TVs. Two, okay, yeah, yeah. Two, you, you mentioned it earlier. Listening to music or podcasts during the game is a big win because you don't yes. technically need yeah. the sound for any sporting event until the fourth quarter. So if you're like, hey, let's listen to a record and I'll just throw the game on. That's a win. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, I've always sort of done that. It just always seems like a better use of time, kind of. But, uh. What do you think of the people that don't listen to, uh, they don't like the announcer, so they mute it? My, my wife's brother does this. 
They mute the games. And, and just sit in silence? Either sit in silence or they play music, but sometimes just sit in silence and read and the game's just on. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, if you, I, I can see that. That makes, I can sort, I mean, if you're reading too, because, you know, um, you know, you're kind of looking up, looking down, checking the score. What I've always thought for these podcast things is, I don't know, or maybe this is illegal or something. Why, um, like, why haven't you or like you and I ever done a live podcast during a sporting event, we were both watching. It's that illegal. Would be streaming live. It is illegal. It's, yeah, it's illegal. You'd have to get the rights for it. I wanted to do it during uh, March Madness, and we had uh, we couldn't do it. That would be fun, though. I would love to do that. Well, if, it ever, if it ever becomes legal, I'm in. And, and well, the legality is, is that's like when they say, like, you can't even say a count of the game when they describe like, all the things you can't do. I, I always thought it was interesting. They said, like, you can't even give an account of the game to someone. Well, you, can't, you can't, like, I'd be on the telephone saying it's like, uh, uh, they're catching up or whatever. I guess that would count as an account. They do it, yeah. I mean, you yeah. you listen to Mike and the dog before they broke up. They would always do that with games. They'd always have to be careful about, oh, hey, you know, a day game or something. Hey, cheaters up. You know, but then they'd have to, like, couch how they kind of described what happened because you're not allowed to give play-by-play. It's a huge fine. Um, I'll, uh, I'll work on that. I'll, wor- I'll try to work on the legality of, of uh, some of these things. Um, Chuck oh, I suppose you could, or, or, or one last, I guess you could do it to, like kind of the old uh, uh, Wizard of Oz Pink Floyd style. You could tell people to TiVo a game, and then you could say our podcast will run like at midnight. Start playing the game then, and it will all sync up. That's interesting because Damashek and I wanted to watch Roadhouse and do it that way, where we tell the people, "Okay, press play now," and then we just talk for an hour and a half as Roadhouse is on. But that would work for a game. All right, Chuck, we're going to wrap it up. Ten minutes turned into 45. As always, we appreciate it. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. You bet. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. This concludes another installment of the BS Report. And with all the talk about sports, Bill Simmons neglected to mention this very important final thought. Eat bold with Subway Fiery Footlong Subs. So hot they'll burn the wimp right out of you. Like the intensely delicious new turkey jalapeno melt. A fiery twist on a legendary flavor with bubbly Monterey cheddar and spicy Chipotle Southwest sauce. And the back by popular demand Buffalo Chicken Fiery Footlong Sub with fire grilled chicken smothered in smoking red hot sauce. Subway Fiery Footlong Subs. They're boldest yet. Subway. Eat fresh.